So a very big important idea here, we're going to be talking about vector functions. Now you already know what a function is. Let's look at a function. This is a function, uh, this parabola here. Now you might have used this before to model someone, say, throwing a ball. So the ball started here and flew through the air and landed right about here. Now, this function has a distinct limitation. And I can show you that limitation by looking at this equation here. This equation tells us two things. The height of the ball and the distance that the ball has moved across. That's what x is. So to be very clear about this, if we were to put a point on our line here, we can, our function here, we can see that it's 9.6 across right now and 6.4 up at that exact spot. That's what it is. And our function will tell us at any given place how high it is or when it's this high, how far across it's gone. But what it's not telling us is the time at which it is there. How long did it take the ball to get from here to here? We, we don't know. We don't have that information. We don't have it. We only know how far across it went and how far up it went. Now, we could write a different function, a function that had time instead of horizontal distance and height here. But if we wrote that function, then we'd have time on the x-axis and height on the y-axis, and we wouldn't know how far across it had gone, and we just wouldn't be able to figure that out. A vector function is going to be able to tell us all three things simultaneously. It's going to be able to tell us its horizontal distance, it's going to be able to tell us its height, and it's also going to be able to tell us at what time it is at each of those places. All right, so let's write up what's called a vector function, and we're going to write it in a very specific way. R with respect to t. All right, so instead of like f of x, we've got rt, right? Notice I've got my little squiggle here because this is a vector. All right, so let's write it up. Uh, we're going to write it as 6 ti plus bracket 12t minus 5t squared j. Okay, that is your first vector function. So what does a vector function look like? What does it do? All right, note, a vector function is a vector. All right, it's saying this is, this is a vector. So it's, it is an arrow. Uh, now, let's get a slider up. There's our little slider here. That's going to change the t values here. All right, so where's my vector? What, where is it? What, what's going on? I can't see it. It makes sense that I wouldn't be able to see it right now because it kind of doesn't exist right now. Because if t is equal to 0, let's see what happens when we sub 0 into our function. 6, 0, i plus 12, 0, minus 5, 0, squared, j. You're going to get 0, i plus 0, j. That's a vector. It's a vector of 0 length, 0, i, 0, j. Okay. Now, let's see what happens when we start moving time forward. Whoa. Here's an arrow. You can see an arrow. All right, so I've gone from t0 to t1. Look at, look at the movement. Look at the movement. This is my ball moving through space, right? That's what a vector function does. It's a vector that points to various points along the path of, of whatever it is that you're following. Now, we're talking about a ball, but it, anything in motion can be modeled using a vector function. Okay, so uh, why don't we just do something a little bit fancy here, turn a trace on and watch this thing happen. Okay, that is what a vector function does. A vector function shows you something's um, position in horizontal space, its position in vertical space, but also the time at which all of these things are happening. Now, what if we wanted to know something? What if we wanted to know, well, where is the ball after, I don't know, two seconds? Where is the ball after two seconds? Well, we can see here the ball is 12 across and, and 4 up. But, you know, what if we didn't have this fancy software? What if we just wanted to use our vector function to figure that out? We just do what I did before. Before I said, well, at time 0, and I sub 0. 
But if I sub time 2 in, what do we get? We get 6 times 2i plus 12 times 2 minus 5 times 2 squared j. Alright, so we get 12i, which is what we expect. You can see my dot here, 12, plus 24 minus, uh, that's going to be 20 j. 12i plus 4j. Aren't vector functions useful, right? If you've got a time, you can find its position at that time. 12 across and 4 up. Its position in terms of i's and j coordinates. So that's your first big lesson here. If you're given a vector function, you can sub in a value for t into your vector function and you can find the position of your particle, your ball, whatever it might be at that time. Now, I didn't choose this vector function by accident. Look at the original function we had. This was our parabola, our h of x function, our height function. This function and my vector function, they follow, they match up perfectly. We can actually take a vector function and convert it to a Cartesian function. When we do that, we lose information. We lose the time information, but we get a Cartesian equation and we can do all the things that we've done with Cartesian equations in the past. So the next thing we're going to learn is learning how to convert a vector function to a Cartesian function or equation. All right, so we're going to take this and we're going to convert it to a Cartesian equation. I don't need all this big picture stuff anymore. Let's get rid of that. Okay, super straightforward here, and you need to be thinking um, simultaneous equations. That's the sort of brain space you should be in here. Now, the x-coordinate of our dot, the x-coordinate of our dot at all times, lines up with this here, this 6t. So, we can say that the x-coordinate of our dot is always equal to whatever our i coordinate is, 6t. And similarly, we can say that the y coordinate of our dot, let's get rid of that, we can say that the y coordinate of our dot is equal to 12t minus 5t squared. Sorry about the squeak. This is great. And so now what I'm saying, you should be thinking simultaneous equations here. What we can do is sub one of these equations into the other equation. Now, Generally, you want to sub the simpler equation into the more complicated equation. So, I'm going to take this equation here and rewrite it so that t equals something. t equals x divided by 6. Right? And now, I can take this and sub it into this equation for t. Alright, so let's do that. We can now say that y equals 12 times x over 6 minus 5 bracket x over 6 squared. Okay, uh, 12, over, 12 times x over 6, that's 2x. And then this is x squared over 36. So we get 5 times x squared over 36. We have finished. We've converted this vector function into a Cartesian equation. Beautiful. That's how it's done. Uh, perfect. If you look at our equations, we had a vector function, which was 6ti plus 12t minus 5t squared, j. And we've been able to convert it to this equation right here. 2x minus 5 times x squared on 36. Now, one last thing I'll mention about these sorts of questions is we might be able to add a little bit extra to this, right? So, remember that we were modelling this ball travelling through space, right? Now, our equation here, vector function here, we could add some extra bits to this. So, we could say, yeah, this vector function models the ball as long as t is greater than or equal to zero. So, adding this extra little piece to our function means that we don't get silly answers like uh, negative 
time values uh, before the person threw it. Because if we did do that, we'd be able to move backwards in time to a time when the ball was like way underneath the earth somewhere. So it doesn't make sense for the t to be greater than zero. Sometimes it does, but they can. when you write a vector function, you can put a restriction on that t value. You might even say that t, hey, t can only be greater than zero, but it also needs to be less than, uh, I think it's 2.4, because at time 2.4, the thing hits the earth. So let's put another little restriction on here. We can say this vector function models the, the motion of this ball between time 0 and time 2.4. And so another question you might get asked is about the domain and range of this vector function. All right, so what is the domain of this vector function as it's currently written? As it's currently written, the domain of this vector function, let's take a look at it, is from this point, 0, to this point, 14.4. And the range is from 0 up to whatever the highest point of our Cartesian equation is. How do you find the highest point? Well, you have a Cartesian equation right here. You know how to find turning points of parabolas. Now, of course, if you were asked a different question, if you weren't given this restriction, if this restriction wasn't here, then the domain and range would be very different. The domain would be all the real numbers, right? The x values can be anything. Their range would be all the values from whatever this number is downwards, right? Because it can't have a, a, a y value of 8 or 9 or 10. That's the highest it ever gets to. So that's something for you to consider. Domain and range, that's things that you've done in methods. The same things apply here. And it really depends on whether you've been given any restrictions on that time parameter and what your Cartesian equation actually looks like. All right, that's pretty wide-ranging first video on vector